Namaste. Jai Jagannath. Thank you to Chief Minister of Odisha, uh, Mr. Naveen Patnaik, the Council of Ministers, the Chief Secretary, the Development Commissioner, uh, Senior Officers of the State, and all the people of the State of Odisha for giving me the honor of addressing you today. I would also like to thank Dr. Sahu and the Sai International School for inviting me to come to the beautiful town of Bhubaneswar and to have the privilege of speaking with the bright young students there. This has been another great example of international cooperation between our countries in space. Uh, it began with collaboration and sounding rocket support near the dawn of the space age. This relationship has grown to current work with the Indian Department of State and the uh, Indian Space Research Organization even this past October, uh, as part of the Civil Space Joint Working Group, our country has discussed our joint work in Earth science, planetary science, and heliophysics. We currently have 13 agreements between our space programs, among the most of any non-ISS country, and have a bright future of cooperation. The relationship, this relationship, is important for exploration and for mankind's future. The International Space Station, in my opinion, is the best example in human history of international cooperation, and it is only the start. Space is a borderless universe, which has a unique magic to both inspire future generations, but also to unite us for a common goal of exploration and improving ourselves. To explore Mars or any truly great achievement, it is a complex and expensive endeavor that no one can do alone. Space provides us an altruistic goal, one that allows us all to come together and unite as one team so that humanity can evolve. Today I will talk through my story, the background, the science, the outreach, and even the fun that I had on my recent mission. I want to put a personal touch to the story of space. I will then answer any questions you have, and throughout it all, I would like you to think about what a great example uh, this is of what we can do when we come together as one team. So with that, let us begin the presentation. Usually I walk around a lot, but I'll stay here so everyone online can hear what I'm saying. All right. So I took off from uh, Kazakhstan, the Baikonur Cosmodrome, and flew to the International Space Station on a Soyuz FGAL rocket. Uh, all the green and orange that you see are part of the three-stage liquid oxygen and kerosene rocket, and the white section at the top carries our spaceship and is an egress uh, system that can pull us away from the rocket in the case of any emergencies. They actually build the rocket horizontally and then rotate it into the vertical launch position. Uh, and it's an amazing sight to see. The clearance is only a couple of inches uh, as it rotates into position. While our rocket is being prepared, we're preparing with lots of training. But in Russia, as in, in India and the United States, tradition is important. We honor past heroes like Karolyov and Gagarin. Uh, we sign a book in Yuri Gagarin's office, the first human to go to space. We also sign the door of the rooms where we stay in quarantine in the Baikonur Cosmodrome as kind of a lasting testament to space. From there, we wave to everyone and, and head off to a building where we put on our spacesuits, which are vital to our safety. If there is a problem with our spaceships, uh, we need to be able to survive in the vacuum of space, and these suits allow us to do that. We also uh, are in a quarantine center, so we have to say goodbye to our families through a, a thick pane of glass, and then we walk out to our rocket. Uh, the rocket, since it has liquid oxygen as one of the main components of our fuel, is frosty on the outside, so what was once a green and orange rocket is now uh, mostly white but it still makes fire. And in eight and a half minutes, we are in space. We have a, a highly technical device called a stuffed animal on a string. 
And when it starts floating around, you're in space. So that way we know that, no kidding, we're up there. Uh, we have a few more, slightly more complicated uh, systems that then help us find the space station and go in for a docking. Uh, multiple systems, and we can even do it manually if need be. Then once you uh, dock with the space station, you come on board, uh, ceremonial handshakes and hugs all around, and uh, you have a press conference with your family. Uh, my wife asked me what I thought of being in space, and since most of my vocabulary revolves around the word awesome, uh, I described it this way. We'll see if you can hear. But it's a, it's a burrito of awesomeness smothered in awesome dust, baby. It's so beautiful. So rough translation, it's really cool. Uh, I... One of the very important parts of uh, space travel is our resupply missions. And two days after I arrived, we had the uh, orbital ATK vehicle Cygnus, uh, the SS John Glenn dock. This is a special cargo vehicle because while most of our vehicles burn up in the atmosphere, we are not only able to put trash that will burn up in the atmosphere, but also experiments like this one, which looks at destructive forces on reentry. Uh, so it will undock and then take two weeks uh, to do that experiment before re-entering. But it's a great example of teamwork, and I'd like you to hear what I said when we released it. And that's important to realize because the team is really what makes it happen. So two days later, uh, there were only three of us on board the space station and only two on the U.S. segment, myself and Dr. Peggy Whitson. Uh, we were able to, uh, with just two people, capture the SpaceX 11, dock it, unload it, do the entire science complement, reload it, and release it in a little over one month. Uh, this was a pretty incredible feat, and it was only possible because the space station program has gotten so efficient at controlling what we can from the ground and amplifying or leveraging the capabilities of the crew on orbit. Uh, a few, about a month and a half later, we got the SpaceX 12, uh, and I like this video because it'll show you some of the activities in a quick manner of what we do after one of these vehicles docks. We have to make sure that there are no leaks that would compromise the atmosphere on the space station. We remove some equipment and then put on special gear uh, in case there's any contamination within the vehicle before we open it. Uh, we then go in, test the atmosphere, uh, open the, uh, the hatch and begin our long process of unloading the cargo. The thing that's nice about unloading cargo when you're in space is it doesn't weigh anything. So even those very large pieces of equipment are easy to move around. Uh, because Fyodor Yurchikin was only was on the Russian segment by himself, I had to also be checked out in the Russian progress system and the uh, Toru docking system that allows us to control both the docking and undocking of those vehicles which carry our critical fuel and uh, uh, oxygen, water, and, and all the supplies that we need in order to make this space station run. The most important supply that we have and the most important thing that they carry is our science. That's the reason the ISS exists. We have experiments ranging from large bays that you can see here that are almost as tall as me. Uh, this is a biophysics uh, experiment. Right next door we have a combustion chamber that is looking at the effects of flames and, and fire on orbit due to the uh, lack of convection and gravity that would normally supply oxygen to the flame. On orbit, the carbon dioxide that is produced in the reaction pushes the oxygen out of the way and the flame actually puts itself out. We have to understand that in order to have more efficient combustion uh, studies here on Earth, but also to build engines that we can use on orbit. The ELF experiment actually levitates small balls of metal, uh, melts them with a laser, and then as they cool, due to that lack of convection, it uniformly cools and we can create alloys that are lighter and stronger than anything we have on Earth. We also have a wonderful piece of equipment called the Microsciences Glove Box that allows us to isolate dangerous experiments from the crew or to protect the experiments from our contamination. Uh, you can see one that I was doing here and my buddy Peggy 
uh, using the glove inserts uh, to do an experiment in this, in this incredible piece of equipment. Uh, we also have lots of robots. These are spheres that come out of MIT and they are programmed by students to solve tasks uh, from all around the world and then we do international competition to see who did the best. Uh, this is a, a sorbent uh, contactor bed that actually uses capillary action to scrub CO2 from the air uh, without any moving parts. So it's an amazing accomplishment and that's a good example of the technology demonstrations. We also test several drugs. This is one I called the cancer-seeking missile as an old fighter pilot because this drug actually goes after and targets antibodies within cancerous lung tissue cells but leaves the healthy lung tissue alone. So it is, allows us to have a smart chemotherapy that will hopefully change the way we fight cancer. There are other robots. Uh, in Japan, uh, you have to bow to everyone. So of course, when I met this robot, I had to bow to it and uh, say hello. We do a lot of uh, studies with all sorts of technology. Also in the Japanese segment, we have an incredible machine that, uh, that is an airlock, which allows us to put equipment outside or to bring it inside. This is a microsatellite launcher, which we put on that airlock. We slide it out the airlock to grab it with the Japanese robotic arm, and then we're able to launch these satellites into orbit. Uh, we actually launched 41 satellites in a little over two weeks. So it's an incredible technology or ability to get technology into orbit. We also do a lot of experiments with children uh, ranging from elementary schools all the way up to, to research grants and in colleges and universities. This is the high school that I actually went to in Colorado in the United States that was doing an experiment while I was on board. We look at vegetation not only for growing plants on long duration missions, but also for increasing crop yields here on Earth through lighting and fertilization techniques. Uh, miniaturization is very important to space technology. This is actually a DNA sequencer uh, that allows us to sequence DNA and determine exactly what it is that we, we find in space. We have a lot of experiments outside the station as well. This is a great example called the Rollout Solar Array which started as a tube and then expanded, uh, giving us a fully functional solar array with much less space. And it worked quite well. Of course, one of the biggest lab rats on the station was me. Uh, we have to do two to two and a half hours of exercise a day so that we don't lose our bone and muscle mass. Uh, one of the biggest ways to do that is our treadmill, which we unfortunately have to wear bungees so we don't fly off of it. We also have a resistive exercise device that is uh, a single point contact to the station so that we don't impart any loads on the station as we are doing our workouts. We also have this rather unique bicycle that doesn't have a seat, you can see. Uh, we just clip into the pedals and uh, roll away trying to get our aerobic exercise uh, each day to stay in shape. Uh, as a result, we want to monitor the status of our muscles uh, and bones. This is an example of a study where we use an ultrasound machine to look at each slice of the muscle and how our exercise protocol affects it. Uh, we also have problems with eyesight on orbit because we don't have gravity pulling the blood down towards our feet and it actually comes into our head, increasing congestion and cranial pressure which can then deform the back of the cornea in our eyes and affect our vision. So we do a lot of testing, including ultrasounds, where as opposed to using that nasty blue goo that we use here on Earth, we can just squirt a big globule of water and it sticks to our face and then do the ultrasound through the water. Of course, the coolest thing that you do on orbit is, or that you hopefully get to do on orbit, is do a spacewalk. And I was lucky enough to do two of them uh, it's an amazing feeling to go outside with just the visor between you and space. That first step is amazing. And you really gain an appreciation for just how massive the space station is. This next shot actually shows you one side of the space station. And if you wait for it, you can start to see little Peggy Whitson kicking her feet. Uh, she's that small white speck up there on the space station. It just gives you an idea of how massive it is 
and why it took almost 200 spacewalks to construct. Uh, we also had to do another spacewalk about two weeks later because one of our computers, which controls the external systems, uh, was malfunctioning and we had to re uh, replace it, as well as put some antennas on the bottom of the station, which we will use for communication to the new crewed vehicles, the Boeing CST-100 and the uh, crewed Dragon, which hopefully will begin flying next year. Another thing that we have to do a lot of is take pictures, uh, mo mostly because it's fun uh, looking out the window on the space station, but also because we can get science out of it. Uh, we take pictures of uh, cities. This is my home, and as a Denver Broncos fan, I had to take a picture of my stadium. Uh, we look at deserts. We look at glaciers. Uh, we look at volcanoes, both old and new. Uh, we, we can uh, see so much from these pictures, and they're beautiful to look at. Uh, we also have the ability, because we cover 95% of the habitable, habitable volume of Earth in our orbit, we can see typhoons, cyclones. Uh, we were able to see the large shadow cast on the Earth as the eclipse happened uh, this summer over the United States. Uh, we look at sedimentation on beaches, as well as lakes. Uh, we look at different irrigation effects throughout the world. Uh, we can also, and do, look at sea life. You can see uh, algae uh, growth. You can see coral formations and how they are growing and moving. And the just flow of water uh, from orbit is an amazing and incredible sight. Uh, this can be used for Earth science uh, as we look towards better understanding of the health of our world and uh, where we're going from here. Uh, water is also, or is one of my favorite things because as you're flying over going 17,500 miles an hour, you see a lake that looks normal. A few seconds later, the sun angle allows you to see the currents within that water. A few seconds later, it looks like almost a mirror or mercury all over the ground. And then later than that, you see these low angles that can almost make the water come on fire. Uh, another thing that we try to look at and that is important in this concept of a borderless universe is perspective changers, as I call them. Uh, we get 16 uh, sunsets and sunrises a day because of our 90 minute orbit around the Earth. And it only takes seven seconds for the sun to go from nothing to a full disk, but it's worth the wait because these uh, images are so bright, there's so many layers and colors that when you see it, it almost changes you as a human being. Uh, this is the sun as it makes its way down towards the horizon. I also liked taking pictures that included the uh, structure of the space station because it really does make you feel like you are a part of, this, of the space environment. You also get to see unique uh, instances like the moon going around the side of the earth that you just can't see on earth. And stars and, and really the, the whole night uh, was my favorite because looking down at the earth as you cruise over it, you see the lightning, you see the lights, you see civilization and, and almost this heartbeat of the world. Uh, and one of my favorites is the aurora because it is a green and purple and white dancing across the sky in an almost lifelike fashion. And then when you look the other direction and you see the stars and how many billions there are, this is the disks of the Milky Way that I took a time lapse of. As we went around the Earth, you feel so small and so insignificant as you realize our, our small place in this universe. Uh, we also have to share this story with people and this was the first live 4K event that we did from orbit. And the uh, announcer was asking me what my favorite movie was. For me, it was definitely the right stuff. As a, as a test pilot who, you know, Edwards was my second home. You know the start where they're, he's like flying through the clouds and he's talking about there's a demon that lives on the major. And then the plane crashes, it explodes, it goes to color. That's just so awesome. And then also space balls, because we're basically flying at ludicrous speed right now. 
So we also have to live in space, right? So here's where it gets a little more fun. We have to do the things that you do here on Earth. So we give ourselves haircuts, bad haircuts sometimes. We have to use a vacuum to capture the hair that tries to get away. We also have to use a vacuum to clean off the filters uh, that keep our air clean each week. Uh, we have to go to the bathroom. So we use suction to make that work. The, the pot is for number two and the hose is for number one, but it works just fine. Um, we also watch movies every Friday night. So we use bungee cords strapped on the wall and then we kind of fish ourselves in like little spiders in a web to watch the movies on the ceiling. We play with all sorts of, of kid toys because they behave so wonderfully up there. We celebrate our holidays. It was the American Independence Day while we were on orbit. I was married, it was our 20th wedding anniversary, so I married my wife again, and my puppy was not up there, but I put him in the picture anyway. Uh, Velcro unfortunately trashes your socks because it's everywhere. Um, and this wonderful spacesuit was actually constructed by small triangles painted by cancer kids all over the world. We had a large PR event with eight different countries represented so we could talk to those kids from orbit and they could see their creation fly. Uh, of course, you have to play with your food. This is by far my favorite way to drink my coffee in space ball form. Uh, and no matter, that might look disgusting to you, but it tasted great and it was super fun to float. Uh, also pudding. So if you can take an entire packet of pudding, squeeze it onto your spoon, and then in your best effort, try to eat the whole thing at once, uh, you might be in space. But I, I did recover. Oh, here it is. There he goes. Eating is just, a, and, and spending time together with a crew is just a, a fun, fun thing to do. Yeah, I'll also have to test out your uh, physics. And my nickname is Two Fish, so I was swimming with the fishes uh, before I ran into the wall. Oops. And it, so you see that there's science, there's living, there's fun that we do on space, but at some point we had to come home. So after five months, uh, we closed the hatch and began our journey home. It takes about four to four and a half hours uh, from undocking until we touch down. And it's an interesting experience because you do that deorbit burn, you separate the spacecraft into that small capsule that brings you home, and then you start seeing a pink and an orange and a red outside. Little pieces of your heat shield come by before it chars over with a black uh, film that then pops off as the uh, parachute comes out and prepares you for landing, which, let me assure you, is not a soft landing. Oh, yes. It feels about as good as it looks. But the, uh, the Russian search and rescue forces are there within minutes. They actually watch us undershoot and uh, down to touchdown. So shortly thereafter, they're able to uh, secure the parachute, roll us to a good orientation, and then help us out of the capsule. Uh, because of our workout regimen, our muscles are actually in really good shape, but our equilibrium and balance are severely degraded. So the support personnel actually help us out of the vehicle and then carry us over to chairs where we can call home and, and say, honey, I'm home. Uh, before uh, going to a tent where we actually get an IV uh, for the almost liter of fluid that our body had offloaded as it got used to living in space. Uh, that's important for the blood pressure and, and for our blood volume so that we can work effectively here back here on the ground. You then go to the Kazakh airport and get to uh, do another ceremony, another tradition where you wear these very fashionable purple uh, robes and hats. Uh, say hello to everyone. So I was, I was lucky to be on orbit with an incredible team, first a crew of five, and then three, and then six, but we were only the lucky last few in a line of thousands of people around the world who make space happen. Uh, as one team exploring together, it's, it's a great reminder to all of us of the amazing things that we can do when we work together as one team. This is, this is the start of the borderless universe that we can that we can help to build and uh, and explore together as one team. With that, I would like to answer any questions from either folks in the room or around the state of Odisha.